I assume you are socially irresponsible and have watched enough television to be in a state of agitation, confusion and anxiety about the totally real and not manufactured climate crisis. Or are you one of those bigot science phobes who denies science and hates poor people and children? We are creating this movement every day because every day of inaction drives more action from us! I am afraid. How come why is the governments, corporations and media not listening to these suffering children's grassroots global movement? Climate activists need to support other social movements too. Because any fight for justice is your fight too. So when kids rally for gun safety or for LGBTQ plus rights, or when teachers ask for livable wages, get your butt out there and support them! I'm mad at my parents because look at where we're at right now. Like, we're all gonna suffer if we don't start doing something now. Wow. This is, like, so like, serious. That girl shook. These poor suffering children are suffering so much and just want the bad grown-ups to be good and take hashtag climate action now. Hey, Amelia here, and we're bringing you a very special episode of Newsbreak all about the global climate strike. Millions of students all over the world have hit the streets. This real global Marches crisis requires an immediate global solution. I do not hate children. This is clearly countries. grassroots, not astroturf activism. Yeah. Thanks, Amelia. I'm at a rally in Adelaide and lots and lots of students have come out to take part. And I'm speaking with one. Why is this such a big issue for so many kids? I think this is such a big issue for so many kids because our future is being decided entirely on the decisions that are being made today. This horrific global crisis requires an immediate global solution that we obviously don't have time to question or discuss. I do not hate children. I am not a bigot. This is an incredibly important cause and um, this is an opportunity for them to stand up for their futures and that's definitely worth missing school for. Everybody wants us to go to school and I want to go to school because I want to get educated. But climate change is so important that through school that I've learned that we need to actually do something and with our power we should all stand up and fight for what's right. Greta says the best thing people can do is start small because everyone has the power to make a difference. No one is too small to, to have an impact and change the world, so just do everything you can. In keeping with all things environment, let's check out some happy stories of people doing their bit to help save our planet. I, for one, am ready to accept the solutions to this completely legitimate and not a scam worldwide existential threat. Let's check out His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Al Walid's YouTube channel to see if plant based news is covering this breaking news of the hashtag climate crisis. Surely Klaus and the vegan movement will be taking appropriate action to face this imminent and immediate planetary threat that will surely destroy everything very soon if we don't take appropriate hashtag climate action right now. Than the rest of the earth. Temperatures over parts of the Arctic will increase as much as 54 degrees Fahrenheit this month. Our house is on fire. Our house is falling apart. We are right now about 11 years away from that climate breakdown will become irreversible. Wow. This is serious, and this video is already a week old. Let's see if the most recent videos have some solutions we can implement to combat this completely serious and imminent real global catastrophe. And we will never stop fighting, we will never stop fighting for this planet and for ourselves, our futures and for the futures of our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Three years ago, I guess, I'm not quite sure, but three years ago, round about, you radically changed the life of your family. You managed to have your family stop eating meat, for example. How did you do that? And what did it take to convince them? I... Not... Quite I'm much. I'm shaking with goosebumps right now. This brave grassroots 16-year-old human shield is on every television station in the world fighting for the solutions. 
I'm so glad there is a way to avert the imminent catastrophe that all the real science has proven will destroy everything if we don't take action now. If the adults don't sterilize themselves, put us on birth control, pay carbon taxes to the World Bank and IMF, move into a social engineered smart city and eat a plant-based diet of mass-produced kibble made from processed monocropped patented GMO plant foods, this poor 16-year-old human shield will not have a future. And so on. They always had excuses, but then I... I made them feel so guilty. You made them feel guilty? Yeah. I, I, told, I told... Bad news for your parents. Yeah. What's that? I, I you aren't convinced? What the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you stealing poor Greta's future? Why do you hate children and the planet? Why do you support murdering Bambi and Simba? And, and then they decided to, to do those changes because I have made them guilty. Now all of them are vegan. I'm so excited to be vegan like my heroes, Greta and Klaus. Let's check in on Bill Gates, selfless philanthropist, friend of former champion of science and fellow philanthropist Jeffrey Epstein. He must be working to help us face this real, credible death threat from the climate. Some people don't recognize how important Nigeria is. In Sub-Saharan Africa, almost a quarter of the people live in one country. I'm here with my friend, Aliko Dangote. A lot of people, that they are not really aware of the malnutrition issues that we have in Nigeria. Malnutrition is such a gigantic problem. Part of it is just getting enough food. But another part is getting various vitamins, micronutrients. Rejoice. Bill Gates, major shareholder in Monsanto and Beyond Meat, and his friend, the richest man in Africa, are putting extra special vitamins and minerals in the industrial plant-based GMO kibble they want to feed all of Africa and the world with. Saving the planet and not eating meat or animal foods never felt so good. If we could get more GMO corn and soy into Africa, we can stop the hashtag climate crisis. And now, whatever that we produce in Dongote Group, whatever you eat, you have micronutrients there. You know, here we've got flour that's got the vitamin A in it. Here we've got uh, salt with iodine in it. We gathered 13 of the CEOs that produce 80% of the foods that we sell in Nigeria, and they committed to adding nutrients into whatever they are producing. Which will have a big impact on health. What we just want is for the government regulatory agencies to make sure that, yes, it is enforced everywhere. It is enforced everywhere. I trust in this and, and want the government have. to put nutrients in all my kibble. Equality is delicious and nutritious. It have a huge impact on all of Africa. I'm so relieved. Let's go back to plant-based news and find some more evolutionary vegan solutions to the truly imminent climate Armageddon. Looks like plant-based news has taken a day off from fighting the real and not made up hashtag climate crisis to make a sponsored recipe video ad for a fake vegan cheese made by a company that mass produces real cheese in the UK. Great timing. It's been nearly an hour since this newly converted starving vegan has had an unnecessary vegan snack. Nothing stokes the revolutionary fire in my vegan soul like a healthy, sustainable fake vegan cheese meal in my smart city coffin apartment. I feel so good about myself. I feel so happy and not malnourished. I am ecstatic and smiling inside. I do not want to cry. And it's just completely dairy free. So if you are lactose intolerant, then that's, you know, this is a great alternative for you too. So when it came, we were pretty um, surprised in a great way at we how good and realistic it is. It's so good. It's lovely raw and it melts amazingly, yeah. isn't it too? Mm -hmm. So we're going to make some really good recipes. This one I'm really excited about because it's um, this recipe and lifestyle is so and acceptable and, and is really healthier for myself uh, and the planet bacon. than real food. This is a sustainable vegan meal of fake cheese fried in Roundup fortified wheat flour and GMO vegetable oil. I do not wish this was real animal foods. I am very empowered against the hashtag climate crisis. I am not deceived. We are all one. I can become a god. I am being the best version of myself. I am being the change that I want to see in the changes that must come in these changing times to come. The animals will thank me if I get a vasectomy. 
The climate crisis is going to kill everything if we don't all do this. I am happy and choose this. I like making vegan recipes like the people on the screen. I am smiling large inside. My mother is the earth and my father is a closet heterosexual. We evolved from cosmic sludge. I will stop craving real animal foods eventually. I feel healthy. Veganism is desirable and easy. I would gladly pay a carbon tax to the World Bank. Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide. I am saving the planet. The climate is changing and if I don't eat this instead of real animal foods that 16 year old human shield won't get her future back from the abusive grown ups. I am not deceived. I am not in denial. I am an activist. Hello, hello. We good? What's that audio? Microphone check, making sure we're good over here on the back end. I think we're good. <sighs> I think we're good. What's up, bigots? Coming at you from my office, from the red light district of my house, my office right now. Got the uh, the little the little biglets are asleep. They fell asleep during evening prayers every night. Every night they fall asleep exactly the same. I had like maybe three minutes into evening prayers. They're both on the ground, out. <laughs> uh, one of the one of just the the practical benefits of praying with your family every night is your children fall asleep <laughs> really quickly. They fall asleep right away. Um, so that's always nice. That's always good. We got a, we got a bunch of bigots over there on Rockfin. Bunch of bigots on YouTube. What's up, guys? What's going on? We're talking about the revolution today. We're talking about talking about blood and soya. <laughs> title this title this talk: Blood and Soya. <laughs> Get it? Veganism and the revolution. History, misanthropy, and useful idiocy. And man, we got we got a lot to talk about. I got all I got a bunch of notes here. Got it somewhat outlined. We got a few really good sources to pull from. I've actually been reading um, reading this book, James H. Billington, Fire in the Minds of Men. This one, let's see, there we go. Fire in the Minds of Men, Origins of the Revolutionary Faith. This book, I'm telling you, this book is absolutely incredible. And I read the whole thing. It's about, it's big. It's, it's a big one. It's a, it is heavily cited. Mucho citaciones. I mean, every single chapter, each chapter has a couple hundred citations. Just the, uh, the bibliography and the index are extensive. Uh, let's see, the content of the book without the index and citations is probably about 500 pages. A little over 500 pages. My goodness, my goodness, what an incredible book. Um, got a few quotes that we're going to pull from there. Uh, actually, a few of these quotes that we're going to pull from James H. Billington's book, Fire in the Minds of Men, The Origins of the Revolutionary Faith. Some of these quotes actually made me want to talk about this, made me want to talk about the connection between the revolutionary faith, the revolutionary uh, ethos, the revolutionary spirit, uh, the the culture of revolution that we live in and that we've been enmeshed in that every single one of us grew up in and how that relates to veganism right what what the heck does veganism have to do with the revolution what does veganism have to do with revolutionary ideologies right i thought i thought vegans are just maybe misguided Idealists, misdi misguided ideologues who want to uh, liberate the animals. They want to help the animals. They want to save the bunnies and all this. Well, yes. <laughs> You're kind of correct. You're kind of correct. <clears throat> it goes way deeper than that. It goes far deeper than that. So... Veganism, vegetarianism, dietary ideology, and utopianism, and revolutionary thought go way back. 
this goes way back. It goes back further than the uh, than most people would trace the roots back to. Uh, now we've talked about veganism. We've talked about kind of the revolutionary ideations and the ideology of veganism before. Um, several talks on this channel. God, I've done so much the last few years. Done so much the last few years that it's uh, it's hard to keep track of all these topics that we've hit on. But today we're going deep. We're going deep. So if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to share the videos, like the videos. This channel, even if you search, even if you search the exact title of some of my videos, most of my videos, you're not going to find them on YouTube. It seems like this channel is, uh, is on the naughty list of the algorithm. It's on the naughty list of the algorithm. And we have been absolutely blacklisted. We've been absolutely... Um, uh, the, this, long story short, YouTube freaking sucks. <laughs> so uh, if you're watching over there on Rockfin, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. So you guys share the videos, like the videos. It's up to you guys to get these out. It's up, for, uh, it's up to us to get these links out. It's up to us to spread these videos because they get, they get no love from the algorithm. In fact, even if you're subscribed over there on YouTube, guess what? If you're subscribed over there and you hit the bell icon and you want to get those notifications, you ring that bell, you're still not going to get notified. <laughs> even if you've subscribed on YouTube, it's highly likely that they will unsubscribe you. But over on Rockfin, we get none of those issues. So pull up a tab on Rockfin. Jump over there. Get over there to Rockfin. Second half of this is going to be exclusive on Rockfin. You watch over there on Rockfin while we're live for free. It's a great platform. You could say what you want over there, which is pretty nice. And we can actually monetize. I can actually monetize over there. So let's get into it. Blood and soya. Um, the roots of veganism go way back. Right? This idea of diet as a way to utopia the idea of diet as this like purity ritual the idea of diet as something that we can that we can use for liberation of our soul this actually goes back further than you know the modern hippies the modern uh, raw food vegan purists it goes back much further than that so first we're going to talk about a few of these sects that actually interacted with early Christianity. So we'll be reading a little bit from St. John of Damascus on heresies. St. John of Damascus, great Orthodox saint, theologian. Highly recommend checking him out. A little bit, a uh, little bit heady for some, like probably not the best introduction to Orthodoxy is it's, uh, you know, conceptually very dense. Anyway, some of the, uh, some of the sects that he names here some of the sects that he names as uh, heretical sects, sects that were teaching uh, doctrines that were apart from Christianity, that were contrary to Christianity, and are, this is early Christianity, right? So he's not going to talk about the Seventh-day Adventists. We'll get to them, though. <laughs> we'll get to the Seventh-day Adventists. He's not going to talk about the uh, you know, Ellen G. White and her special uh, super clairvoyant powers and visions that led her to think that she's going to recreate Christianity and find the truth of Christianity and, and rebuild it uh, around her, uh, her strange beliefs. St. John of Damascus talks about the Nasireans. There's a quote from his book on heresies. The Nasireans, which is interpreted as meaning the rebellious, forbid all eating of flesh meat and do not eat any, any animal food at all. Up to Moses and Joshua, son of Nave, they accept and believe in the holy names of the patriarchs of the Pentateuch, Abraham, I mean, and Isaac, and Jacob, and their predecessors, and Moses himself, and Aaron and Joshua. They claim that Moses is not the author of the books of the Pentateuch, but they stoutly defend other books different from these. So, again, one of these sects, the Nasireans, who forbade the eating of flesh and all animal foods. The Ebionites also, another quote from St. John of Damascus, the Ebionites closely resemble the aforementioned <laughs> Serenthians. Ah! I'm getting tipped. Racism, man. I love to racism, we, we are not racisming against the Ebionites. The Ebionite queens. We was Ebionite kings. The Ebionites. <clears throat> the Ebionites said, uh, St. John of Damascus says of the Ebionites, the Ebionites closely resemble the aforementioned Serenthians and Nazarenes 
in some aspects, the heresy of our Samsians and Helxesians. Helxesians approach theirs. Uh, they assert that Christ and the Holy Ghost were created in heaven and that Christ came to dwell in Adam, then for a time put him off and finally put him on again. They say that he did this and is coming in the flesh. Although they are Jews, they use the Gospels. The eating of meat they hold in abomination. They hold water to be in the place of God. So they, they believe that water was God, right? This uh, purity of God comes from water. Eating of flesh, they held an abomination. They furthermore hold, as I have said, that Christ put on man and his coming in the flesh. They bathe in water constantly, both summer and winter, reputedly for the sake of purification, as do the Samaritans. All right, so they denied the divinity of Christ and, of course, replaced Christ with water and they forbade the eating of meat. Uh, the Encratites, who happen to be a branch of the Tatianists, the Tatianists, uh, also reject marriage, which they declare to be of Satan, and they forbid all eating of animal food. So this kind of Gnostic idea, remember the Gnostics believed that flesh was bad, right? That the created world, physical world, is bad, and that the spiritual world is this higher reality. And, of course, that often leads to vegan... All right, then... One of the most important ones that we're going to touch on in the early pre-Christian world is the Pythagoreans. Of course, this is a sect that was still around after Christ. And St. John of Damascus is writing about some of these Pythagorean sects here. Uh, the Pythagoreans, or Peripatetics. Pythagoras held the monad in providence. He also held that it was forbidden to sacrifice, that is to say, to sacrifice to the gods. He furthermore forbade the eating of animals and enjoyed the abstinence from wine. He made a distinction between things from the moon on up, which he said were immortal, and those below, which he said were mortal. He also held the transmigration of souls from body to body, even in the case of animals and reptiles. He taught that silence should be kept for a period of five years, and finally, he called himself God. So that, that's a lot going on right there. Fascinating, right? Pythagoras, of course, the Pythagorean cults before the Incarnation were very popular. Uh, and they had various kind of resurgences and ebbs and flows in the pre-Christian pagan world. Pythagoras eventually called himself God. So he ended up going from veganism and the forbidding of eating animal foods, or just all animals. So maybe, uh, I'm sure milk would have been okay. Honey was probably okay. They weren't even as extreme as the vegans that we're going to see later. But he said that, uh, I'm, I'm God, bro. Like, that's where he ended up. I'm God, you're God, we're all God, but mostly I'm God, because I'm more God than you guys. He was, he, was, he was way more God than everyone else, and he believed in the transmigration of souls, right? So even like reptiles and fish, they had uh, an eternal soul that would transmigrate through these animals, and these ideas actually ended up being expanded on and kind of uh, physicalized or immanentized uh, through Darwin, right? Erasmus Darwin and his um, degenerate grandson's ideas about the theory of evolution which now makes up the modern cult of scientism's foundation right this cult of scientism builds upon this idea that there is a transmutation of species now, pythagoras saw it as a transmigration of souls which you see as well in a lot of the indian sects which also many of them hold to vegetarianism not all of them but some of them, and some of it seems to be for more practical purposes. Some of it seems to be for more uh, political purposes and uh, for the purposes of keeping the elite well-fed in some of these Indian cultures. But that's beside the point. So Pythagoras. Pythagoras is super important. He's a very important figure that we're going to learn a little bit about today. And Pythagoras, a lot of these sects that you see coming out of the revolutions... Right, the revolutionary spirit that kind of took over Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, ended up toppling the monarchs, toppled the French monarchs, and then eventually toppled the last monarch, the last Christian monarchs in uh, the world, um, in Russia, in the Soviet Bolshevik Revolution. So, yeah, Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras, he was really important. <clears throat> Post-Enlightenment uh, is really important to the post-Enlightenment and Enlightenment uh, esoteric orders. Uh, if you look at Freemasonry, they're obsessed with Pythagoras. 
Pythagoras is hugely important to the Freemasons, to the Masonic lodges. Of course, he believed in the transmigration of souls. This was later turned into the transmutation of species in the Darwinian mythology. He believed that meat eating actually dirtied your soul, right? Eating meat is bad. Eating meat makes you less spiritual. It makes you less able to uh, contact the divine. It makes you less able to uh, perform the Pythagorean theorem. Right? Pythagoras who actually was obsessed with mathematics as well and triangles and circles with the obsession of a lot of these occult orders and esoteric orders with geometry, kind of the idea of like the music of the spheres. Pythagoras was obsessed with all of this. Okay, he believed that meat eating dirtied the souls, prevented union with high reality. And of course, he, by abstaining from meat, ended up becoming quite able to contact these higher realities. And he even believed that he was God himself. So he believed that he was God. He is the highest reality. Let me make sure I'm still live here. Sorry, I was looking at the back end on Rockfin. And it's, it gave me the option. It said, your stream's ready to go live. But I, I thought I was already live. What's going on here? What's going on, Rockfin? We still live on Rockfin? We still live on YouTube? I'm having some. Oh. Was it going red? Is that no, happened? it's been it's been five. So we'll have five okay. Six. All right. I think I'm good then. Oh. Nope. No, right. Of course. Hmm. Okay. Blipped out there for a second. We good? We back? No, it's back and forth now, right? You watching? Well. It's the same time every time. This is eight a little bit earlier. Like yeah, last time was eight. Come on. Frozen. Yeah, no, it was going in and out. Might be coming back now. All right. Nope. Let's see. Is it back? I just restarted Discord. I don't think the problem OBS. is Discord, though. Nope. It's doing the same. OBS. Not Discord. Yeah, OBS. I called Discord. See if that works. Seems like we might be back. All right, we're good. We're back. That was very, that was really upsetting. It was like ten minutes. Yeah. That that, was the longest one. What a waste. What a waste. Where are we? Start talking about Pythagoras and his his perfect triangles and his theorems of immortality, his mathematical and dietary theorems of immortality and it just dies you, you can't just sit there and smile at me like that the whole time i can't do this while you're doing that i appreciate it it's very distracting you can sit and you want to sit with me you can but 
And that was freaking nuts. All right, guys. We're back. This has happened about f what, four times in the last few weeks. Almost like 8 o'clock, 8.30. It just decides to do that. Don't understand it. Don't understand it. But we're live. We're back. We're talking Pythagoras. We're talking blood and soya. Veganism. The revolutionary spirit. The revolutionary ethos. And how veganism ties in with the revolution. The idea of the revolution. Okay, so diet as a way to purity. Diet as a way to sanctity. Something that Pythagoras was obsessed with. He was obsessed with this. Diet was just one of the things he was obsessed with. Also obsessed with numbers, mathematics. And the idea that numbers and mathematics would bring you to uh, higher realms and higher truths. Right? Saw mathematics as kind of a pathway to the divine. It's like, when you really look at it, mathematics are something that require... A, a transcendental God, right? There's something that, that point to and are actually a good proof for the existence of God. But he kind of held himself to be God, right? <laughs> he worshipped his own intellect and uh, actually believed in the transmutation of souls. And he ended up influencing a lot of these people, uh, these revolutionaries, after the Protestant Revolution... Right, the first revolution in the West, which was the Protestant Revolution, Pythagoras highly influenced the revolutionaries in the uh, post -enlightenment, uh, enlightenment world, <clears throat> and a lot of the Enlightenment revolutionaries as well, and a lot of the occultists that gave birth to uh, many of these revolutionaries that we saw take over and sweep through France and then eventually uh, Russia. So, back to uh, James H. Billington's book, Fire in the Minds of Men. Billington. He was the librarian of Congress, right? He wasn't just some, uh, some wild, kooky guy that was, uh, you know, obsessed with secret societies or something like that, right? He wasn't writing about any, you know, grand narrative conspiracy. He's writing about history in his book, Fire in the Minds of Men. He was the, I think he was the 13th librarian of Congress, um, and he was under Ronald Reagan, and he was a highly accomplished scholar and academic. I think he taught history at Princeton and Yale. So he was a legitimate historian, right? Like this is this book, Fire in the Minds of Men. It's huge, and this is one of probably one of the best history books. I haven't even read the whole thing. I've only read sections of this, but one of the most important tomes of history that I can think of. It was published in 1980, and you can actually get a PDF of it online. Huge book. 500 pages at least and um, very important work yeah sure um, all right so James H. Billington in his book he talks about the idea of the revolution how the revolution is not just some thing that comes about it's not just some uh, what would you say not just like the, the this natural progression towards the revolution. It's not just something that happened in a vacuum. It's not just something that came about um, divorced from a worldview, divorced from a set of beliefs, divorced from a set of presuppositions. It was actually a faith. He said that it is a revolutionary faith. Right? The revolution was not to Billington. It wasn't just a isolated incident that happened in a vacuum something that is brewed in the, uh, in the occult orders coming out of Germany, in fact. Right, so this is from the introduction to his book, Fire in the Minds of Men. James H. Billington says, This book seems to trace the origins of a faith, perhaps the faith of our time. Modern revolutionaries are believers no less committed and intense than were the Christians or Muslims of an earlier era. What is new is the belief that a perfect secular order will emerge from the forcible overthrow of traditional authority. This inherently implausible idea gave dynamism to Europe in the 19th century and has become the most successful ideological export of the West to the world in the 20th century. 
So James H. Billington sees the revolutionaries not as just uh, purely secular, right? He actually traces the origins of their faith, the beliefs of their faith, right? They're a faith that has like a creation myth, many different creation myths, right? They all kind of ape Christianity in certain ways, the religion and the patriarchy that they wanted to throw off. They all end up creating a, uh, a mythology and mythologizing kind of a, their own bastardized version of Christianity, which is what's funny too. Um, you know, the system that they say that they're rejecting, that they say that they're transcending, the system that they say is archaic and patriarchal and mean uh, and, and, and false, they actually end up always just recreating a bastardized, dumbed-down version of it. Isn't that weird? Isn't that funny? Um, so he says, it's not a story of revolutions, but of revolutionaries, the innovative creators of a new tradition. The historical frame is the century and a quarter, a century and a quarter that expands from the waning of the French Revolution to the late 18th century and the beginnings of the Russian Revolution in the early 20th. The theater was Europe of the industrial era. The main stage journalistic offices within great European cities, the dialogue of imaginative symbols and theoretical disputes produced much of the language of modern politics, so modern political language. And he wrote this in the 80s. I mean, it's gotten so much crazier now. Now you've got, you've got BLM. Um, you've got the, uh, the climate crisis, the revolutionary climate crisis folks, all pushing the same mythology, the same ethos, the same revolutionary faith. And the vegans and the vegetarians, they're a part of this. Now the vegans of today, their roots go back, as we just talked about, all the way back to guys like Pythagoras. Pythagoras was really influential and on Plato as well, right? So Plato had this model of the Republic, this utopian ideal. Revolutionaries use this as they model society for many centuries after this. Uh, Freemasonry uh, very much reveres both Pythagoras and Plato for their work. Um, Plato actually saw vegetarian uh, vegetarianism in a vegetable-based diet as something that should be used in his ideal republic and, uh, and fed to the underclass masses. Right? So this seemed to be for purposes of pac uh, pacification. Right? So he saw meat as being something that should be a luxury because he said that it would lead to decadence and war. And that's an idea that came from Pythagoras uh, that Plato actually held to. Right? Remember Pythagoras said that meat would make people aggressive and warlike. Right? Whereas you want people to be docile and submissive in a uh, revolutionary utopia society like this. They believe that docility and submission could come through dietary asceticism. That's veganism, vegetarianism. All right, so uh, Plato's Republic was, uh, <clears throat> was also used... I'm sorry, uh, was, Plato's Republic was used and uh, was one of the very popular models by the revolutionaries later on. Of course, Plato was before the Incarnation, before Christ. Uh, where am I? Where did I go? Ah, Plato's Republic. He also talked about the abolition of private property. He also talked about the abolition of private, private property and the family uh, among the ruling class, which is kind of a, a funny thing, right? Now, it wasn't just the, uh, the lower classes are going to eat a vegetarian diet to keep them docile, but the ruling class... All right, should be solely focused, basically married to the state. All right, so you had this idea of like kind of uh, this uh, monk-like priestly class of the philosopher kings and the ruling class, and they would abolish private property. Uh, later on, Weishaupt and uh, Marx would like these ideas and kind of modify them in their own little utopian systems, their own utopian revolutionary systems that kind of pulled from all these traditions as well. And a lot of these Marxist revolutionaries also had the idea that animal liberation and veganism were not only something that's good and inspiring, but some of these revolutionaries, some of these Jacobins in, included, believed that, well, they, they had their kind of like their, <clears throat> their conversion story involved 
veganism and vegetarianism and looking at farm animals and thinking, oh, we need to liberate them. It's so sad. Look at these poor animals. Humans are just obviously abusing them by keeping them on their farms. Um, which is something you still see today, right? All our vegan friends, they're obsessed with animal liberation. They want to liberate the animals, get rid of farms, get rid of the evil, mean family farms because the evil, mean family farms are so abusive. They're patriarchal and all that. Um, so, Billington's book here, he kind of goes a little bit further. He's talking about the occult roots of the revolution, right? It's not just... It's not just something that is a faith. It actually has its roots in occultism. So writing about these revolutionaries, he says, a recurrent myth for revolutionaries, early romantics, the young Marx and Russians of Lenin's time, was Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods for the use of mankind. The Promethean faith of revolutionaries resembled in many respects the modern belief that science would lead men out of darkness into light. But there was also the more pointed millennial assumption that on the new day that was dawning, the sun would never set. Early during the French upheaval was born a solar myth of the revolution, suggesting that the sun was rising on a new era in which darkness would vanish forever. This image became implanted at a level of consciousness that simultaneously interpreted something real and produced a new reality. The new reality they sought was radically secular and stridently simple. The ideal was not the balanced complexity of the new American Federation, but the occult simplicity of its great seal, an all-seeing eye atop a pyramid over the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, in search of primal natural truths, revolutionaries look back to pre-Christian antiquity, adopting pagan names like Anaxagoras, Chalmet, and, Anarchar and Anacharsis Clutes, idealizing, above all, the semi-mythic Pythagoras as the model intellect turned revolutionary and the Pythagorean belief in prime numbers, geometric forms, and higher harmonies of music. Okay, so this, this obsession with Pythagoras went beyond just the obsession with numbers, right? harmony through numbers, sacred geometry and all these ideas. They're still obsessed with these things. But uh, vegetarianism and veganism and diet also played into this. And of course, Pythagoras was the, the OG super spiritual vegan. Right? He's, he's spiritual, not religious, and he's vegan. So the, uh, the origins of this uh, of this faith, of the revolutionary faith, reach way back. And Pythagorean mysticism is something that's always been important to them. So another quote from a little bit later on in his chapter, chapter 4, about the occult, the occult origins of the organization. He says, The plain fact is that by the mid-1810s, there were not just one or two, but scores of secret revolutionary organizations throughout Europe, extending even into Latin America and the Middle East. These groups, although largely unconnected, internationalized the modern revolutionary tradition and provided the original forum for the general debate in the modern world about the purposes of political power in a post-traditional society. So this idea of destroying tradition, that's what the revolution is about. The revolution is not about helping people. It's not about philanthropy. It's about destroying tradition. They think that if you destroy tradition, if you destroy the roots of our civilization, which the tradition that we're, they were seeking to destroy is Christianity, right? Uh, now, now the patriarchy is the, the, uh, the buzzword, right? You've got to smash the fash. Everything's fascist. You've got to destroy the patriarchy. Actually, the, the fascist movements and uh, communist movements both have their roots in this revolutionary atheism that swept across Europe after the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment. Another book, if you guys uh, want to look a little bit deeper into this, of course, we're reading some quotes from Fire in the Minds of Men. Also, you're going to want to check out Father Seraphim Rose's Orthodox Survival Course. Father Seraphim Rose, The Orthodox Survival Course, fantastic, fantastic book. You can find the, uh, there actually is, a, somebody did an audio book of it uh, on YouTube. You can find a good recording of that on YouTube. Check that out. You will quite enjoy that. All right, so... He says here, in what follows, I shall attempt to show that the modern revolutionary tradition as it came to be internationalized under the organizational ideas originated more from Pythagorean mysticism than from practical experience, and that the real innovators were not so much political activists as literary intellectuals on whom, Germ uh, on whom German romantic thought in general and Bavarian illuminism in particular exerted great influence. So 
Of course, Billington gets into the influence of Bavarian Illuminism, German Romantic thought, and the occult. The occult played a huge role in this. Flipping again, it's gone. I think it's coming back. You coming back? This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, all right, it's back now. Sorry, guys. We are currently experiencing a cyber pandemic of the unwaxed. <laughs> All right, I think they say that they can hear us, I believe. Hmm. Got to reload some of these pages here. I had a couple stream labs, or at least one, well, at least one person, at least one of you guys, at least one of you bigots was able to find this stream on YouTube despite YouTube's working so hard to destroy people's ability to find this channel. At least somebody was able to find this video. But, yeah, we, we are experiencing some serious, serious tomfoolery here. But OBS seems like it's, it's, it's going now. We're good. All right. You guys hear me? All right, we're good. We're good. All right, there we go. I'm trying to load the Streamlabs here. I know I had a, we had a tip to read. We had a tip over here on Streamlabs. You guys are watching on YouTube. You know what? The uh, we're getting a lot better. We're getting a lot better reception over there on uh, on Rockfin. So I know we, we, these streams on YouTube. We've been pushing everybody back over there to Rockfin. Pushing everybody back over there towards Rockfin. Rockfin is the place to go. Rockfin is where it's at as far as. Being able to say what you want, being able to actually monetize the content. Remember, you guys, we need you guys to help share these links. You guys got to share these videos. We are unable to really get the uh, the word out using the uh, the algorithms over there on YouTube. So, thank you guys who do support. Thank you very very much. The Green Feathers, the Green Feathers donated ten bucks and said excellent topic. He donated that via Streamlabs. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The Green Feathers. I got your email earlier, man. And I responded to you, so yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to chatting on your channel over there, Green Feathers. I appreciate the uh, the support, man. Appreciate the support from anybody who decides to drop those tips over in the uh, in Streamlabs. Let's come over here. We got some tips on Rockfin as well. We got to read these Rockfin tips too, because the Rockfin bigots they know how to support. Rockfin bigots they're always they're always showing big love for the streams. We appreciate all you guys on Rockfin, all you guys on YouTube. Make sure to hit the thumbs up, share the videos, like the videos, do all that stuff. Do all of that stuff. Leave a comment. Leave a nice comment. Share the videos, like the videos. All right. This page is taking forever to load. I'll read those in a second. Um, all right. So... The idea of the Pythagorean vision, the Pythagorean faith. 
as forming the foundation of the revolution. This is something that's really important that Billington is driven home in a very extensive chapter with tons of citations. We're not gonna, we can't just, we're gonna just read the whole chapter here, but I would if I could. If I had the time, I could. If I, if I had the consistent internet connection, and my, <laughs> my page would load, then I totally would. Thank you, guys. Look at that. We got some Rockfin, Rockfin bigots or big, big supporters. Uh, ELC tip twenty bucks says the internet supply chain issues will continue until everybody gets v worded. <laughs> Little frog tip two bucks over there. So I just want to let the stream know there is a way to push back against workplace vacation mandates. We're winning right now. There we go. All right, let me, all right, you guys on YouTube, if you're on YouTube, go over there to Rockfin. If you're on YouTube, jump over to Rockfin. We're going to cut the stream on YouTube. We're just doing it on Rockfin now. It looks like the, the, the internet issues are done. We're going to continue talking about it. We're going to learn a little bit more about veganism, the revolutionary faith. We're going to get into some of these post-enlightenment revolutionary figures, including Ben Franklin. It's a really interesting guy called John Goodwin Barnby. Barnby is fascinating. Uh, Joseph Ritson and also Percy Shelley, the husband of Mary Shelley. And eventually, we're going to get to everybody's favorite revolutionary vegetarians <laughs> whose names you can't even speak on, uh, on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, we got the uncensored second half of this stream. Second three quarters of this stream <laughs> over there on Rockfin. Jump over to Rockfin. Join us over there. Thank you guys for watching on YouTube, but we're taking off. We'll see you over there on Rockfin. And if you're on Rockfin, hold tight. Share the videos, like the videos. Make sure to subscribe, upgrade to a subscription if you're not already subscribed. And drop them tips if you feel inclined. Cut it on YouTube. All right. Bye bye, YouTube.